prepare the dark night. All iconic pieces of cinematic history. All with one thing in common. John Gaglione Jr. From the original cast of Saturday Night Live to big screen blockbusters, John's legendary career has a resume full of iconic characters. Please join us as we reveal some of the magic behind his Academy Award winning makeup and special effects. And welcome everybody to the Nerd Initiative panel with John Caglione Jr. I am Tony Abdallah. I am the one of the founders of Nerd Initiative. We're a collective of creators uh, celebrating all different types of fandoms. With me is my partner in crime tonight, Mickey Smith. And speaking of celebrating fandoms, what more to celebrate uh, than the, illust the illustrious colleague career of John Caglione Jr. John? Good luck, John. <laughs> Film fan myself. I think he, uh, you know, I love it. It's great. So we're gonna ask a few questions, do a little quick interview with him, and then if you have questions, we may have time at the end. Uh, so no first, math questions. Please. <laughs> That's why I got into makeup. <laughs> so one of the things that we do with our initiative, John, could you tell us your nerd origin story? What got you into makeup art and design? Uh, I just love the monster movies. You know, the old monster movies and. And on, when I was a kid growing up, grade school, my parents would make us up for Halloween. Mm -hmm. And they would spend hours making us up. And we would just laugh our asses off, having a great time, my brother and my sister and me. And it just was something that we did every Halloween. So it was that in a combination with the horror movies, like the old universal horror films, like the, the Frank, Frankenstein, Jack Pierce's makeup. And, uh, and then I saw a movie when I was about 10 years old, I saw the Man of a Thousand Faces with James Cagney, yeah. where he played Lon Chaney, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh man, it's like this grown up guy who is an actor, does his own makeup to, to work and survive. So I think that those kind of, that combination of things really kind of set the wheels in motion for me to try to figure out, you know, how to do it. I remember being like terrified of the old horror films and my mother was like, John, you know, that's a, that's a makeup person that has a kid. I thought they were like from a freak island somewhere. Right? <laughs> and I was like, okay, so you can actually learn how to do it. And so that was all like a combination of things that kind of got me kind of excited about trying it. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, speaking of origins, uh, we know you have like a great story featuring your idol, Dick Smith, and mentoring you. Um, yeah. What did you learn being mentored by Dick? Well, the one thing that Dick Smith, by the way, did the makeup in The Exorcist. All, all the demonic makeup on the, on the glare. He did the, I don't know, people don't know, maybe they do realize, but this old Father Merriman movie, the old priest, that his whole face is prosthetics. Because Max Foncino, who played Father Merriman, was only 40, I think it was 45 or 46 years old. So those are the big makeups. Everyone goes for the demonic makeup. Dick also did the makeup in The Godfather on Marlon Brando. But what he taught me is that you, you know, you just, you can always improve. You know, you can't think you got it made, and you know, I know everything, and because that's what he did. I mean, he just perfected his craft. And I mean, Dick Smith brought a hyper realism to makeup that didn't exist before. Like, you look at The Exorcist, that's 1972, yeah. and that old age makeup holds up today. It's still like, like remarkable. Like, I saw the re release of The Exorcist out on Long Island, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that makeup still holds up. And so that's it, you know, you can't just think you got it made and you can always improve and uh, the better you get, the harder you work is what he really taught me. So that's something that I always learn from Dick Smith. Now you've worked on a lot of productions, a lot of films, a lot of shows. What was the first or the most seminal moment for you in your, in your, in your career that kind of sticks out to you the most? Uh, well, you know, I guess the one that I've maybe been known for is probably Dick Tracy because that was uh, I'm from New York, and back in 1988 when I got Dick Tracy, a lot of people didn't go from New York and work in Hollywood, so it was a big deal just to get the job and then and, and to prep it in Hollywood and to get into the union there. So that was a big deal, and you know the rest, you know, winning the Oscar and, and all the things that happened because of Dick Tracy. Thank God for Warren Beatty because uh, he brought me out from New York and. 
But the backstory is I did a movie called The Cotton Club a few years before, and I did the prosthetics, and I was recommended by Dick Smith to, to go in and meet Francis Ford Coppola, who was directing the, job, the Cotton Club. And the production designer, Richard Silver, and the costume designer, Milena Caminero, on the Cotton Club. So when it came around to Dick Tracy, they got, they were on Dick Tracy, and they said, there's this guy in New York, Johnny, who does prosthetics, and he did the Cotton Club. So those kind, that kind of connected me to Warren, and in a way, just that referral got me to Dick Tracy. And, and then I met Al Pacino on Dick Tracy, and that was incredible because we really worked well together. And, uh, and then Al had me on a lot of his movies. I think I did like 15, 12 or 15 films with Al since Dick Tracy, so. And then to work with Al is amazing, you know, just incredible, I think one of the greatest. Told me how to, you know, prepare, how, how the actor prepares for a character, so that was really incredible. So I guess the seminal one is Dick Tracy, because it led to so many other things. Yeah. Well, it's a legendary movie, and I mean, that's a great story, but when you were working on Dick Tracy, is there a moment you knew or something came to light? Did you, did you ever think that this was going to be like an Oscar one? This is going to be big. You mean for the makeup? Yeah. Well, no. that in the movie, the whole thing. Anything yeah, well, like I mean, it was, I mean, we were just thanking God that we were out there doing the movie. <laughs> this was incredible. It was a big break. So there was that, but um, it's a yeah. So, you know, I didn't really, we, we, we just like, we had very little time to prep Dick Tracy. Wow. We had to go out to LA, build a shop, because Warren Bay didn't want to pay somebody's overhead. Mm -hmm. He was like, I'm not going to pay a big Hollywood studio to do my movie, Dick Tracy, and pay for the whole. So that's what kind of got me Dick Tracy. We went out, we built the shop, a little shop, 1,500 square feet, half the size of this room, Dick, Dick Tracy in it. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, toward the end of Dick Tracy, Warren came up to me and said, you're gonna get the statue. And I was like, I wasn't even thinking, like, you mean like, like the Statue of Liberty? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> was so in the movie and so worried about getting it done right. And then it, it happened. So yeah, Warren kind of predicted it at the very end of Dick Tracy, but we were just like, you know, just pounding away at it, just trying to get it done and that'll be good. Now, now imagine you're on that stage receiving the Oscar, one of the, yeah. one of the biggest honors you can receive. When did it, how did it set in? What did it feel like? I was kind of nervous like I am right now. Because you know, <laughs> I'm not good, good with the public. You know, I'm better mm -hmm. like, in the makeup room. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I, was, I was nervous. And, but the great thing about winning an award like that is that your peers say that you were the best that year. Like, you know, your peers. And that's, that's a pretty remarkable thing that they just think you, know, you are. Your work is really good. So that, that was amazing. But I was a nervous rat, like, like I am right now. <laughs> but you know, it's just like half of you doesn't want to win, and then half of you is like, I do want to win. So, yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, fast forward a bit, and we got to talk about Dark Knight and mm -hmm. Heath's Joker, right? Mm -hmm. um, what was that partnership with Heath like? How did that dynamic work? Oh, how did you guys get along? Well, it was great. You know, it was really like I I went out to Burbank Studios and I read the Dark Knight. They wouldn't let they wouldn't give you the script. You had to read it in an office of Warner Brothers in Burbank. So I had to read the script, and then right after I read it, they brought me to meet Heath and Christopher Nolan in a wardrobe thing on one of the stages there. So I met them, and it seemed like it went okay. I was you know you're never really sure, and I was like maybe it didn't go right. And then they called me like a few hours later. Okay, they wanted to do it. And so they flew me to London, and I started to just play around with Heath, you know, do some makeup. And we were just like very loose, trying things. And, and then the turning point came when Chris Nolan came in and brought these books on Francis Bacon paintings, these very blurry, distorted images. Because in the beginning, I was thinking like a makeup guy. Oh, it's going to be clean lines and, you know, all this stuff. And they were like, no, you got to let your hand go. And uh, so those books really helped us kind of get the broken down thing. So it was between Heath and I and Christopher Nolan, that was a, a great collaboration to get what we did. And then Heath's performance is like, you know, and it's amazing. I mean, the thing I want to say about actors and Al Pacino, and I'm dropping names here, but they make me know. I mean, it's the great performances by these actors that really, like, you know, you go to The Dark Knight and you see that amazing performance in that beautiful movie. And then maybe they go away and they say, uh, that clown maker was pretty cool. I wonder who did that. So
So that's how it really goes, you know? <laughs> They're the ones that make you, you know, kind of known. So I just wanted to say that going in, and, and it's the truth, it really is. And that's across the board, I think, for any makeup artist. It's the performances, it really is. And that's amazing, because it makes your portfolio <laughs> Oh, was that me? Did I have a senior moment? I... <laughs> Sorry. I think this panel deserves a better class of criminal. Oh. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome the clown, the clown prince of crime, um, my partner in crime, uh, the donation of Michael Rothman. <laughs> now there's a reason for this. So so John was able to do this work uh, beforehand. So John, can you just looking at this, the the prosthetics, the makeup, all of it? Can yeah. you just explain a little bit to us? Well, you know, Michael's a great sport. I took a life cast of him, <laughs> and in a, in a few days ago at my shop on Long Island, I have a home studio where I do all this stuff. I, I sculpted this prosthetic, and I'll show you, if you're curious, I have some, you can go over it. But I, I did this, uh, you know, my comic book, comic book version of the Joker, and uh, th this is it, it's just really fun. We did it in a few days. Oh, here's some of the pictures, yeah. You so saw that, that ugly face right there. Was, um, <laughs> this was like, you know, two and a half hours of sculpture. I don't, that's not the finished one, there's another. I think, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah that's, about, that's about two and a half hours, you know, really fast. And uh, then I make the molds, and I did it in foam latex because it's just cheaper, you know. <laughs> and uh, not that you're not worth it. But. I can't. <laughs> it's hard to look at that. I'm sorry. But it was just a, a labor of love, you know. So any chance to do makeup is like, you know, I'll, I'll jump at it. And uh, and that's yeah, we just did that in, in Michael's apartment today. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, ignore the wedding pictures behind me, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And you're actually looking at the first time it ever went on, which is nerve wracking because you know, you don't get a test. It's like that's the test. So you know, of course, you know, when you're doing it for for a movie, or you, know, you you get a few tests and you get to re redesign it and do a few things. But I, I think it came out pretty good for the first go. I think it's beautiful. The details, the nose, and the face mold. A comic booky version. Yeah, versus so we, the Heath Ledger one. Yeah. I just wanted to ask the inspiration exactly. It's like a combo of new and old. Like, yeah, I just can't. You know, it's just like you know the Joker is the, the, the lips and the eyebrows and that kind of thing. So I just did. You know, it's my little spin on it. I guess you know. But, uh, do you have any recommendations for how to get into um, prosthetics um, if we don't, if we're not able to get a life cast of our own face? Yeah, you, you stole my cue cards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so yes. one of the things that we really want to make sure, sure we showcase, John, please explain Thank you, kind of a little bit what you're doing. And ask that question. There's a QR code there. If you're interested in cosplay, makeup, and design, John, can you explain a little bit about your workshops? Oh yeah, well, I started the makeup artist workshop. It's online. And uh, you know we have certain lessons that you can buy, beauty makeup and character makeup. I do a glamorous witch makeup, step by step. Uh, I mold making, advanced mold making and sculpture is there. And then you know we, I had to do Zoom where I do one on one with students, That's awesome. and it's all through you know uh, online. So it's the makeup artist workshop, and uh, you know I'm out there, so you know we can do it on the computer together, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. And I try to design it for each student if I can, what they're interested in doing, and just target that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's like, that's the way it's done. It's, it's a lot of fun, it really is. Okay, cool. And, and definitely, you follow that, and I think they're also with the handouts. Now, we're a, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, and so what we're gonna do is, if you receive the cards, you'll notice that there are numbers on some of the cards. Um, we're gonna give you guys some things away. Um, we, we, we don't like to do anything without giving gifts. Um, so... Yeah, do I get a gift? Huh? Do I get one? You got, you, you got I did, I know. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't noticed, so when you sad. go to see, John, John is definitely going to want to be able to talk with you guys if you guys want you know, to come up and everything and see the Oscar. If you didn't see the Oscar already, the... Big Tracy yeah, Oscar right here, which I almost broke everything. There's more where that came and he's not just an Oscar winner also, he's an Emmy winner as well. I, I, I didn't get to say that at the beginning, it's on the flyer, but um, so we're gonna we're gonna pick we're gonna pick five numbers. 
um, for five different prizes, uh, between one and 65. So John, yes. pick the first number. Pick the first number, the one, the one and 65. 38. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'll, I'll be your Vanna White. It's okay. <laughs> Show that off. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. All right, so then the second number, um, you did, what was the number again? The 38. 38, okay. My age. <laughs> yep. Well, then I'm going to do my worse. number. I'm going to do my age, 24. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately. It's heavy. And that one's right here. Mickey? Let's go with lucky number 13. And, and, and think about questions. We've got plenty of time to answer questions as well. We've got two more prizes. We've gone 13, 13 Let's go a little bit higher. So let's say uh, 62. Hey. Hey. John, will you, do the, will you do the honors of the last one? Yeah. Go um, lower. Go lower. <laughs> go lower. <laughs> Just maybe one lower. One lower? <laughs> oh, I can't. Um, 27. 27. Oh, you get the grand prize for today. Christian Dale signed up. Oh, that's awesome. So, so we've got plenty of time, so we can add. Yeah, we're definitely gives you some good. Um, Mickey, would you be willing to stand over there? So what we're gonna do is, if you have a question for John, Mickey's gonna stand over here with the microphone. Um, you can come up and ask that way everybody can hear the question. Um, so we'd love to have you do, do that. While he's doing that, uh, John, one of the, my favorite stories that you told us before um, is is not even about a production that you did. It was about helping out a friend, Val Kimmer. Um, can you talk about? him and his need to put a little bit more Italian. Oh, <laughs> yeah. the, the job he didn't get. Yeah, yeah. He, well, you know, he gets calls every once in a while from some friends and actors. And he wanted to go for the Ray Liotta part in Goodfellas. He really wanted it. So he came to the shop and I did this, you know, Paisano makeup on him. We took him to Little Italy and we shot all over Little Italy and a tough guy with the cigarette and did all this stuff and he didn't get the part. No. Now the the, the well, best really part about it, amazing in it, but the best part about it was yeah. you tried you tried to like help him look more Italian with his nose, like oh that yeah oh, that part oh, the baby the baby bottle nipples in the nostrils oh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah to wind in his nose we, no time he's like John can I come over to the shop now you can make me Italian so I, I took like baby bottle nipples and I cut the like made rings. And put them in his nostrils. Oh and he actually let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it just widened his, it just threw him off, you know. It, it, oh. And he liked it, so <laughs> thank God. But he, but he didn't get the part. But it was fun working with Al. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody with questions? Yeah, I'm no, it's a wired mic, so yeah, he has to yeah, stay 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 We can only go so far. I apologize. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so thank I asked, you for coming. Thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, so my question is, you know, if you're on a movie set or if you're walking around a convention, you get hot, you get sweaty. So what are some tips for kind of like keeping your makeup set all day? It's always a problem. <laughs> it's, I just, it's the, the number one, like, oh, no, it's, it's going to be hot today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's always a problem. But, it, you know, for us, it's just maintenance you know where you're trying to like you're trying to pick your moves you know with an actor on set and so i usually wait for them to get into a medium or close-up shot before i go in and start you know messing with makeup but it's all it's it never ends okay. uh, to give you an example it's like you know heath ledger in the, in the dark night he licks his lips and it was to keep the appliance on his lower lip you know but it, he made it work in his performance which is great but the, the edge of the appliance would constantly be a problem because, you know, it would come up after a while. So instead of always going in and trying to fix it, he would just lick it yeah. and keep it down and he, you know, so that, that worked. But it's always That's a so problem. Cool. It's always a problem. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I wish I had the magic answer. For you. <laughs> Best thing that happened while, while, while this was all going on, I walked into Michael's apartment today 
after John had already done the makeup, and the first thing I see Michael doing is licking his lips, and it was the, it was the best thing ever, because it's like, even though he doesn't look like Keith, like, it just gave just so many great vibes. You mean once the appliance is on just to keep it yeah, maintaining like, it? Yeah, you mentioned, like, everything's starting to, like, look up and look at that, and you can't always get to, like, the bathroom or something. Yeah. And, like, fix it up again. What's something that you desperately want to have in your kit? To keep the appliance yeah, on it. The edges one, start yeah. to come loose yeah. and around the mouth and stuff like that. Yeah, like a travel size. Just Q-tip, a Q-tip with a little 99% uh, alcohol just to clean it, just to kind of get get it clean under the edge. And then I, I use like a, I, something called Prose adhesive. It's a two-part adhesive, and it's really strong stuff. It's an acrylic base, mm -hmm. and I'll use that. I use, I use silicone adhesive on Michael, you know, the Telesis 8 that I use, or the Telesis 5. So I use silicone, because I knew he's not gonna be in it all day. And it's foam latex, it's not silicone. But it's always a problem, it just never is. But, the, but I always keep a Q-tip, 99% alcohol, and prose to get the edges around the mouth and stuff. So I, I would do that. You know. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then the second part of the question is, uh, if you're starting to build your kit to do you get your own, your own special effects or your own like, makeup or whatnot or something else, what are the staples that you think you should have to start off with when you're first building your kit? You mean just a basic beauty kit or a prosthetic uh, kit? Let's go for more like cosplay special effects, like a little bit further in the like, medium, medium. So it's basically like colors and, and, and beauty makeup, you know, like cream colors and stuff like that. Well, Mayron, I'm not just plugging them because I, I used it on this makeup and it was really great. And on Heath, I used a, a lot of uh, water-based colors too. I really did. Yeah. And so I, I used a lot of that. You know, the Mayron colors are really good um, as far as colors. And they have, you know, grease colors and they have the, the stuff that you wear with the Evian and, the, you know, the, more, the aqua colors. So that's good stuff right there, but translucent powder is good. Um, you know, dual surgical adhesive, you know, if you put in a fake lashes and things like that, are good, you know. Uh, good brushes are great, setting powders. I mean, a basic paint kit is, is what you're talking about for cosplay, right? Then if you're going to get into appliances, then that's a whole separate. I was going to ask, more so like, yeah, silicone adhesive and stuff like Alcone Company in New York. They have they have a lot of good products there that you can silicone adhesives and prose adhesives and, and there's a there's a company in LA called RBFX and they sell foam latex appliances and they're pretty good. So you can probably get I mean they have a wide range of prosthetics. So that's RBFX in, in Los Angeles. They're they're awesome. Yeah, I hope I have. So um, I'm also a special effects makeup artist. I'm very like, beginner. Uh -huh. But um, I'm wondering, like, when you were starting your career, did you ever have any moments of like doubt or when you wanted to give up, and what kind of like yeah. made you want to keep going? Yeah, I mean that's a constant thing. You know, not sure. You know, am I good enough? Can I pull this off? And, you know, everything that we're always worried about. I mean, even now, I, I'm, I'm a little anxious before I actually start. I mean, even this makeup today. I was like, will it fit? I mean, I'm really like on the line to make this work today for everyone. So it never really ends. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's a bigger community today. You can reach out to a lot of people, and, and you can get me on Instagram. You can know, private message me, you know, direct message me. But th that's always a constant thing. You know, you know, I have I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? Will this look really good? Will this look cool? You know, so it never ends. Really, um, is that what you're going through right now? Yeah, kind yeah. of. So What's the problem? I mean, what, do you, what, what do you feel? Um, well, I started doing makeup for On and Out on Times Square. They're yeah. called Turvision. Right. Um, they do all airbrush, 
but I guess it's getting like work that's outside of like haunt season or Halloween. Right. Just like getting consistent like projects where I get to like really like expand my skills. And working in film and TV yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, right now we got a strike. <laughs> you know, the writers settled, but now the actors are still out. So it's a problem. I mean, I'm not working right now. So it's like, it's really hard. And a lot of people are, you know, it's it's been tricky. And then we had COVID, and that shut it down. And then we come back and start to work a little bit in the industry. And now we had the writer's strike, which lasted about five, six, six months or more. And now the actors. So right now, it's, it's a tough time for all of us. So I feel your pain. I do. I really feel your anxiety. But if you love it, like something Dick Smith told me a long time ago, to make it in this business, you gotta be absolutely nuts about it. You really, you gotta love it and think about it 24 seven. And he said, even then your chances are slight that you'll ever make it as a professional. So you just gotta you know, really enjoy it. And I, I, I kind of put all my eggs in one basket. It was like, this is what I wanna do, this is it. And uh, with that comes a lot of stress and anxiety and, and ups and downs, I've had droughts. In the industry, so it, it, you know, no one's really got it 100% made. Mm -hmm. And if they tell you that, then I don't know. It's not my career. It's not it kind of life. sounds a little bit like you, you don't just love what you've done; you love what you do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you just got to be crazy about doing it. You know. Mm -hmm. So Did you stick with it. No backup. <laughs> no, no plan B. Okay. <laughs> this is it. You know. After this, I don't know. You know? <laughs> And I've been very lucky to be able to make a living doing it. But there's been ups and downs, and, and that's, that's the nature of the business. I hope I helped. Yeah, thank you. I, I like theater, maybe. So, yeah. Have you done work in theater? And what's the difference with special makeup when it comes to theater work versus film work? Well, not me privately, I haven't done a lot of theater work. You know, I did, I did years ago a, a, a show called Golden's Balcony. That's been years ago. I made a prosthetic for that character, a one woman show. And then I did Frankenstein, the Broadway show, back in like 1980, which opened and closed the same night. <laughs> it, it was just too expensive to run. Oh my God. So I haven't done that much. But I think there's a, there's a the union covers Broadway now. There's a lot of makeup and hair people on Broadway doing shows. Uh, not me. <laughs> I wish, you know. but uh, no, not too much here. Thank you. No. Oh, look at you. When you're approaching a new makeup look, whether it's, you know, for a special effects type thing or just, you know, a more beauty sort of whatever. Where do you take inspiration when you're doing something new, like from previous works, from you know art world, or where where do you usually start to draw stuff from? from all of the above, right? It's like yeah, it's so strange, you know. It's like what do you really go to? I always, you know, me personally, when I'm doing a sculpture or anything like old age makeup or this character, the Joker, I always try to think about what would Dick Smith do because he's my hero, you know. And I think it's sculpture. You know, he brought a hyper realism to makeup, like I said earlier. So I, I try to channel him when I'm sculpting and designing a character. But it, it comes from everywhere. It's like you can never see enough. Like I love movies, you know, I love all the films, you know, Marvel films, but I like, you know, farm films. And you just go and you know, I'm a fan of it all, so it just it's in there. And it just comes out of like when I did the Dark Knight, there was one we, how many times can you do a different joker makeup? And Heath and I were like racking our brains, what can we do that's different? And then there was a scene at the end where he gets interrogated and uh, he gets beat up and he tells the cop how he likes to kill his victims and he wanted something special. And I, I thought of, it just popped into my head, the old Chaplin movies, I love Chaplin, I love silent films, and there was a heavy in all those movies, Eric Campbell played the bad guy in the Chaplin films and he had these great black eyebrows and things. You know? So I said, why don't we do that villain from Chaplin? And he's like, what do you mean? And I showed him the picture of Eric Campbell from the Chaplin films. And he's like, maybe, no, maybe the eyebrows are too. I said, we'll do it. And if we don't like it, we'll just take it off. Mm -hmm. And we went with it. So sometimes it just comes out of thin air. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but 
but it just depends on the subject matter, you know, which you, the makeup you're trying to design. Some of it's a biopic, like when I did Al as Jack Kevorkian, and you don't know Jack. We tried to do like a, a suggestion of Jack Kevorkian with a nose, and I made ears for Al, and the wig, the crazy white wig, you know, the high top. And so we just sprinkled Kevorkian over Pacino mm -hmm. in that film. And so, you know, a lot of it is just research if it's a biopic. And, and then like in The Dark Knight, it was the Francis Bacon books, the, the, the paintings that inspired us. So it just comes from all over. And with great directors, they, they kind of guide you to it. And great actors kind of guide you in a very gentle way to get there. Awesome, thank you so much. So I don't know, I guess uh, it just comes from everywhere. From everywhere. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you for having me. Two questions. Um, first one is when you're using prosthetics or liquid latex, mm -hmm. one of the biggest things I have a really big difficulty with is blending it into your skin. Mm -hmm. So, what would you recommend for that? That's a problem for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for slush latex pieces, liquid latex pieces, yeah. they're tricky. I mean, it's not easy because you get, you gotta, like, I mean, I go with a q tip and work on the edge, but with a better edge. Mm -hmm. But I find with edges, it's where you put them on a person's face. Like some edges, you know, there's some strategic areas where an edge behaves better on the face. But that's always the problem with prosthetics, is where you put the edge and how you, how you disguise it. But, you know, when you're using silicone, that's a problem. And there's certain materials that I use, like Bondo Prosade that's thickened to, 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 to help the edge. And then foam latex, I use dual surgical adhesives and stipple it on, like Dick Smith did in The Exorcist. And, so, but it's, it's always a constant problem. We can talk about it, you know, later. If you oh, want. I'd love to. Over I'd love to, because I have a look I'm trying to pull off, and I did. Oh, okay. Do you got pictures? I do. Okay, so, we'll, we'll check it out. Yeah, we'll look um, at it. The second question I have is with Star Wax. Mm. I have tried using it so many times, and mm. every time I just throw it out, right. and it's just not working. Mm -hmm. When is the best time to use it, and how do you use it? Well, who's Star Wax? Are you using like Ben Nye? Yeah. Wax? Yeah. I think so. It's a little tough. It's it's, it's tough to yeah, work with. Yeah, and I'll warm it up um, in the fingers, and I've also tried to use spirit gum with it, and yeah. then working it out, but it still ends up getting stuck to me instead of my face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I know. Well, I, I used to use cold cream when I used it. I helped that kind of helped to get it away from my fingers. Mm -hmm. Just a light little lubricant on my fingers using it. It depends on the wax. There's a there's a mortician's wax called natural plasto. Are you familiar with that? No, yeah, morticians use it to fix, restore, you know, dead people that have been injured. So that stuff is a little bit more pliable, and it's easier to work with, and you can kind of blend the edge out pretty good. It's called natural plasto. So that's what I've used. And I found that when I was a Cub Scout, because they used it as simulations to do cuts. When I was a kid, I was going for my Cub Scout uniform, and there was natural plasto there. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is a win-win. I got natural plasto. <laughs> I was very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> 1970, you know, 70 lonely. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, no problem. We'll talk later. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, Bedellum's good. I like their, you know, Bedellum brushes are really pretty cool. It's a hodgepodge of brushes that I use, um, or foundation brushes from MAC. I use, I use a lot of, you know. I, lo I love the Armani Silk Luminous foundations from Beauty Makeup. I love those, you know, they, they look good in film. Use them a lot. Um, but yeah, Bedellum I use, and <sighs> MAC, and you know, a lot of just over-the-counter stuff that you can get almost anywhere. Um, and there's so many different brushes. I mean, on the internet, you like it's insane, you know. So it's a, it's just a, it's a, you know whatever works for your hands and your and your eyes. You know? Thank you so much. You got it. No problem. <clears throat> Hi. Um, Hi. With film being such a collaborative of art and sometimes different arts within the film butting up against each other, I was wondering if you could speak on your feelings with um, the use of the effect. Um, VFX and makeup and oh yeah like, you know I was wondering sometimes you see a movie and you're like oh they 
you know, changed my work a tiny bit. Yeah, well, um, I don't have a I don't have a beef with it really. I mean, if it's going to help your your work, I mean, they did it in the uh, what was the movie the the whale. Oh yeah. The, um, Brendan Fraser. They actually helped. They digitally removed some of the edges and and touched it up so it looks very flawless. So there it worked. And years ago, I did the Departed. And I Departed heavy that. And there was a scene at the end where everyone gets shot in the elevator and DiCaprio gets shot in the head. And they wanted me to use explosives and prosthetics, old school, with blood tubing and stuff. And we talked Scorsese out of doing it. We did it digitally. And we did what's called the heal and reveal, where I put the wound on the guy's forehead and blood. And then they digitally erased it and revealed it with a puff of blood. And what would have taken 12 hours to shoot doing it the old way, we did it safely in like eight hours. And in the film, it's like bang, bang, bang. Like three guys get killed within, like you didn't have to take the actor out, put prosthetics on for three hours and put it back in the same spot. Mm -hmm. You could shoot it fluid all the way through. And, I, and it made a difference in the impact, I thought, mm -hmm. in the film. But as Scorsese, I almost got fired because we would, we would talk to him about, look, there's a better way and a safer way. No, no, I want it with like, I did it in a taxi driver, I want it. But, it, but so that stuff I gladly give up to digital. Mm -hmm. And so it can help us. How much anxiety does unsafe practices cause for you guys when they want you to do something outrageous? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it got to the point on that film where I said, listen guys, if you want me to put an explosive on DiCaprio's eyebrow, that I need a, a held harmless agreement from the studio. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, all right, let's come on. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> I, I just see the headline, you know, Don Caglio killed yeah. DiCaprio. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you actually know how it Yes. Yeah. 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 But hey, it's on the hub Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm wonderful. So, are there any particular literary characters that you want to stay in? What's one of your, you know, scenes uh, to do? The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes. Yeah. That would yes. Be cool. That would be a cool character, you know, the sympathetic character, the misunderstood character, you know. And then the makeup. The, I, I love the Cheney version, the silent screen version. So let me follow that up. Uh, would you want to do, especially, you know, the actor can't? I like the Charles Lawton version. Okay. I was gonna say that George Ballard, you can't yeah. really do a lot of the emoting, not saying that you're yeah. your heart's not good. You know, but look at what he did. Right? It's Would beautiful. Would you be okay if they put like a little survey or whatnot in there? You know, get the or do it digitally. Exactly. Yeah, why not? There's another thing. You can do that digitally with Rihanna. But that's a great character that I'd like to have a whack at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Got it. I have to ask this question because it's, it just popped in my head. Have you ever seen something on the screen that they've done digitally that you say, I could do that better? Oh, yes. yes. Good question. Yeah, good question. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I, you know, but I'm not up on like, are you talking about Marvel movies? No, I hate no, to say it. You know, I'm always talking about Marvel movies. I'm going to get booed here. But. No, it's just, no, just, like anything at all. Like, you know. Oh my God, I got people. Not really. No, I, I'm, I'm fine with it, really. I don't think it's all going to go digital. Like, everyone's worried about AI. And, the digital stuff and oh we're gonna lose it up and I don't see that really happening because I remember back on Polar Express people were a little upset that Tom Hanks played all the characters but that was kind of a one-off you know it was like that was that movie and that that worked in that film so I'm not I don't, I don't know maybe I'm misguided and just out of my mind which I, it sounds like you just love the industry. Yeah, I just love it. I don't think it's going to go that way for people. I, just think, I think actors will always need to have makeup put on and look in the mirror and believe it. You know, so those kinds of actors. You know, you know, so. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I was wondering how you handle lace wrap rates. Um, um, I'm trying to work with one. It's so hard to like pull one into it. Do you have one on right now? <laughs> no. <it's> okay. <laughs> I do. I'll show you my lace later. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wondering if you had any techniques or any sort of advice. You know, I'm a makeup guy, so I, if like union wise, I can't do that. Like, but, but I've watched a lot of great hairstylists do. 
So yeah, I mean, it's it's tapping spirit gum, you know, if you're using spirit gum. The right kind of spirit gum that has a certain amount of mat. Like I do facial hair, like I put on beards and fake hair pieces and stuff. And I'm nuts because I, I formulate my own spirit gum formulas with matting agent. I'm like, no, I have like six bottles of spirit gum for certain parts of the beard. So I, it's just, it's it's a preference. But it's I see a lot of hairdressers that are really good. They tap out with silk and they have a certain technique that they use when they're putting so much spirit gum under the lace and tapping and rolling with the silk. You know, you, you know about silk and using silk to press down. Yeah, so there's a whole special technique. But yeah, it's, it's you know, the right spirit gum instead of the... Katie, Katie 151 makes a great spirit gum. KD 151, Kenny Diaz 151. And he was my key on key. Kenny Diaz, he makes a great spirit gum. So I see a lot of people use that on their wigs and it looks good. They're not too much shine, it looks good. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Zach. I am Zach. a uh, uh, beauty artist of a couple years now. I've worked in a couple of different counters, but um, I was. What counters have you worked in? Um, I've worked for Mac. Oh. I've worked for uh, various counters inside of Ulta, and yeah. I did freelance for Mac as well, and freelance for A Cosmetics. Cool. Um, so I've been around. The, I've been around the town quite a bit, but like I uh, I just moved here to New York City last year. And uh, I just found out that you need a license to work in a lot of the places here. Do you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you need a license to be a counter artist, even if it's the most. So you need a beautician's license. You need yeah. like a cosmetology license. Yeah. Right. So I was wow. like, I wanted to ask you if you had any recommendations, what to expect. Like, I didn't even know that. New you know, school stuff. What did, what did that happen? <laughs> It's, it's been around for a while. New, been around for New a York while? is pretty particular in regards to like its beauty licenses. It's even tried to like, it's tried to like break down like the bra the black hair braiders yeah. here. They try yeah. to like get us for a little bit on that. It's been it's been a thing. It's yeah. been a thing. Yeah. <laughs> like well, since like the eighties, like nineties, like that. So it's been a while. Mm. Yeah. So it's regulated. It's more regulated yeah, than yeah, that too. Yeah. It's easy to go to school. Well, I mean, the only yeah. thing to recommend oh, yeah. is no. you got to go to cosmetology <laughs> school. I mean, I think yeah. that's the only way around it, right? My wife is an esthetician, so she had, a, you know, she does skincare and facials and stuff. So you know, I mean, she had to do it to, to work in New York State. I got to know. Um, so you, if, if that's where you want to be. As far as it's crazy, like in our business, I don't need a cosmetology license. You don't? No, no, not when I got in, which was you know during the silent screen era. No, I hope they don't change it. I don't want to go to school. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. They, they should be looking at you saying, pass. Oh, <laughs> oh, look, look, look at the thing right there on the table. And don't yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure this is your license. I, yeah. I, I can't go to the store and get food for that. <laughs> <laughs> they will take it. They're like, that's nice. You got to pay. <laughs> so, I God, that's wild. Yeah, Isn't I, that weird though that I don't need it to do right, what I do? I, I'm I, actors. I'm assuming that you had uh, some sort of license. No, not, not what I got in there. All right, well, we're gonna keep that. Zach, if you love it, you gotta do what you have to do to stay here. I'll be freelancing for doing whatever I can. Yeah. 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 Thank you. How's it going? Uh, my name is Andre. Um, Andre. You mentioned earlier that you were uh, inspired by like the old monster movies yeah. and stuff like that, and then you know, the person with the visual effects versus practical effects. Yes. I love Alien versus Pre Aliens and Predator movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm. You mentioned about Heath Ledger with the whole yeah. tank and everything. I I've seen cop, uh, countless videos on YouTube just talking about the, the uh, practical effects of that. Um, the whole story about how the Predator actually came about with the whole that's beautiful man. that that story and everything. Um, in in the recent say like 10, 15 years or so with, with certain monsters that have been remade or reimagined, have you adopted certain Techniques from others, or have you tried oh, yeah. to, or or have you just tried to do your own thing, sort of? Well, you try to like it's like anything. You're trying to like if you want to learn how to play like blues guitar, okay. you're going to listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan. You're going to listen to BB King, and then you're going to try to play it your way, right? I mean, find your own style, and that's the way it is with artists. It's like you know, I admire so many great makeup artists and those techniques, Predator, and so you try to, you know. Dick Smith, and you try to say, okay, 
these guys are great. What can, how can I bring it? And so that's always the thing. Because like, I, I, I'm not a, um, too informed about like uh, so HR Geiger. Other people's work. HR Geiger, to oh, me, yeah. Pink and the Alien, Alien is yeah. like iconic for me. I, I love that guy. And then, the, like yeah. I said, with the Predator, how it was adapted with some dreadlocks and fangs and everything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, those differences between like how to blend that practical to, to visual. Mm -hmm. um, you said you didn't have a problem with it if it makes the job better or easier. Um, and looking back, do you think, do you have any opinions on how they might have actually done it better? I like practical. I mean, that's where I come from. You know, I'm from the 70s. I started at NBC in 1976. I was 18. So, I mean, that, those were my years of practical monsters. You know, mechanical masks, yeah. the Predator and all that stuff. So, I love it, like, happening right there. I mean, so that's, is, that's is there anything that maybe you could have tweaked to make it look a little better, a little more menacing or something? Or something or Me? Yeah. Those classic movies? Yeah. Oh my god, no. I mean, that's <laughs> like it's, it's like, it's like you, you're talking about like The Thing with Rob Bottin's yes. work. How can you make that better? That is, that is I mean, that's, that's a tour de force thing. Physical, practical effects. You know, that makeup. Yeah, the, 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 the Romero like, movies and, and John Carpenter. Yeah. And all those movies. That's still mindful. Binary. Yeah, it's like yeah. The Exorcist. I mean, there's a new one coming out, but that, the first one, yeah, it's like the story and the, the characters. And, I mean, that's a one-off. I mean, that's like, you know, if you're a film fan, it's like, you can't touch that. Yeah. You can't. I'm a big fan. It's just a fan of all of it, like you. Thanks, Andre. And, and Vlad, these two, and then we're going to... Yeah, okay. no more after that. What do we have to do now? Well, before they kick yeah. us out. Then we'll okay. <laughs> He's going to want to stay out after and, and talk to everybody. So if you want to get a picture with them or, you know, you know, you can try to steal the Oscar, we will tackle you. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make sure we have, we, we leave good on good graces with, uh, with Reed Pop, so. Uh, hi, I was wondering hi. what you thought about some of, like, the full body prosthetics that I've been seeing, like the bloater from The Last of Us this year. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's kind of different or more difficult or, like, the How bloater? I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know. It's about like that. a five hundred thousand dollar full body prosthetic. You see, the last of us kind of the crazy mushrooms coming off their heads. Oh, like that, that full thing. body. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like a mask. It's like two hundred pounds or something. Was that on HBO? Is that the? Yeah. 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 I was just wondering what you thought about that kind of like full body prosthetic. That was How Barry Gow. Wasn't like like that Gow who did that stuff? Yeah. Sure. In, in it London. Baby? Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's amazing stuff. That guy is amazing. How do you think it's like Barry different Gow. from? Face makeup and prosthetics versus like the full body. Like, how would you approach it differently? Oh my god, I don't know if you could do any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know. That stuff is amazing. But I know Barry, he's a great artist. I got to work with him uh, on a show, and his work is just phenomenal. So I don't know. I could, I could, there's no way I could top that. What I love about the fact that you're a fan of it as much as I we are. Yeah. yeah, I'm still learning. Yeah, I'm still learning. It's, it's still inspiring. It's me. And I'm 65. You know, I'm still like, you know, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't answer that. I'm trying to be honest. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a local 798 member myself. Ah. Um, I've only worked on like indie level films, but I was curious on major films. Like, yeah. Somebody asked a big question. I'm actually on the big side, and I know you have to like choose sadly. Yeah. How much overlap is there on major film sets? Of, like, like Heath Ledger did you spray his hair green? No. Like that? You was like, like how no. much collaboration was there? No, that was Jan Alexander that did his hair. And she's from Hollywood, and so now I just uh, I don't you know if the if the, if the hairdresser needs my help right. to hold bottles or do stuff, <laughs> or, you know she asks me hey can I, how do you fix his lace? I'll definitely help, but that's if that's you know, respect. The position, yeah. you know. And you do facial hair, you said like that's. Something. I do all from you know from from the hair down. That's good. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just you know, you stay in your lane. Because <laughs> 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 a lot of these people can take me. I don't want to mess with them. Get me in lock. You know. Thank See, you so it's much. embarrassing. No problem. Before we go, uh, one of my favorite stories. You mentioned Dick Smith and how he's your hero. Um, the, the first time you talked to him, the, how that happened, can you explain oh, what happened? Yeah, well, you mean getting in touch with him? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know where Dick's, I'd seen The Exorcist, it blew my mind. And
him. I didn't know where he lived. Uh, you know, it's like just he was my hero. So I, my mother had a gossip magazine, and in, in the in there was the address for the Linda Blair fan club. She's the possessed girl in The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter to the Linda Blair fan club of Warner Brothers Studios, and on the envelope I drew a caricature of Dick Smith with block letters Dick Smith and The Exorcist, and I sent it. And I tell people, it's like a putting, a, being on a stranded island, putting a note in a bottle and filling the ocean. <laughs> that letter got to Dick Smith, and he called me on the phone. Whoa. Like I was playing football in the street with my friends. How old were you? I was about 15. Cool. Whoa. And he's, my mother goes, Johnny, Dick Smith's on the phone. <laughs> and he's like, Johnny, I got your letter, and I'll answer, send me a cassette tape, and it guys with questions, and it started correspondence. Oh my God. And it was just like that, man. So you reach out to people, because no one survives in this life without the help of other people. You just can't. And so we all need each other. And uh, whether we like it or not, we do. And so, you know, get in touch with people, because that letter made it. And it started my career, and it, you know. For, he met me, I said, you really don't have any talent, John, you're really not gonna make it. <laughs> but then he, he let me stay in touch, and I worked with him, and he saw that I wasn't gonna give up, and, and, and he got me into NBC when I was 18, working at NBC. They were looking for an apprentice. And he says, I got this guy, John, and, so, and he got me into NBC, and that's how he started. As you, which you all don't know, last year was John's first time attending a Comic-Con. We brought him here yeah. on Sunday last year. And he also didn't really know a lot of people were dressing up like the Joker. And one of the people he met was a guy actually wearing Heath Ledger's vest. Yeah, uh, that was He had wild. bought the vest yeah. and was wearing it and yeah. being able to see them together. Yeah. But that's what John's about. And again, I just want to focus on that QR code for a minute. Just like what Dick Smith did for you, mm. you're wanting to be able to do that for other people. Yeah. And that workshop is one. What other person in the industry is going to say, I'll do Zoom classes with you? And... Um, well, that's John. the great thing about, can I just come? Yeah. The one thing about Dick Smith that he left with me is that you could call him on the phone. Like, he's <laughs> known for his, that kind of thing. People would call him, and he would actually, like, answer the phone and, and help you through a problem. So it's just that kind of thing. That's, I mean, that's how I was raised. And like I said, we, we all need each other. So it's like, that's just the way it is. So, I mean, that's, and that's the way Dick was. He's a great man. I love him. Yeah. And speaking of great men, everybody just put your hands together. <laughs> And um, they, we want to make sure we, we're courteous to the next.